Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Bible study on Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we are so excited to be meeting again on Zoom, and we are glad that we are able to meet via this format, and um, hopefully we will have uh, some other folks join in as we get started. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen uh, so you can see the PowerPoint tonight. And I'm getting that pulled up and you should be able to see it. Okay, so we are discussing Ecclesiastes 4. And I would like to begin tonight by reading one of my favorite poems, because um, I think it fits so well with tonight's theme. And also because for years I wanted to take over Garrison Keillor's job on the Writer's Almanac. Um, so um, I'd like to share with you my favorite poem for today, and it's entitled The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Perhaps my favorite line in that poem is, I don't know what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention. Tonight's chapter is structured around the theme of observation and paying attention. Kohelet, as we know, may not be the most prayerful person of sorts, but he certainly does know how to pay attention. It could be argued that the entire book of Ecclesiastes is the direct result of his observations, his paying attention to life under the sun. And these observations will guide our structure and our conversation in tonight's Bible study. But I want to begin by asking the question, um, paying attention in the spiritual life is one of the disciplines we cultivate throughout our growth in faith. And so I'm wondering, what does paying attention look like in your spiritual life? How does paying attention shape who you are spiritually? Do you pray by observation and or paying attention? If so, what does this form of prayer mean for you? And then how might you incorporate observation or paying attention into your spiritual life? I'm wondering, what does, um, what does paying attention look like in your spiritual life? And um, how might that be a form of prayer for you? Anyone? I think for me, it's it's uh, observing nature and all of the miracles and wonders 
uh, around. Sometimes it's uh, finding a, a shell in the crack of a tree that you think, how did that, that get there? Uh, I just said the beauty of a butterfly, uh, the miracle, the awesomeness of the eclipse, the eclipse that we observed in April. Um, and and that's sort of uh, where my attention goes. Mm -hmm. That's great. So for me, it's more of, it sounds crazy, but when I see so much things, like all the negative, I'm like, man, like, Lord, thank you. That is not my fight. Like, that's not my struggle that I have to go through with when I see all these like medical conditions and diseases. And then sometimes when I'm like, I have, I have a, like a condition where I have to take medicine when I eat because my pancreas don't make enough enzymes. But for like a six months, I didn't know what was wrong with me and I couldn't eat anything. So even just thinking about that every time I take my medicine, I pay attention like, man, I don't have to worry about just being in constant pain anymore like I were for that period of time. So it's just thinking and like reflecting on some of the things I've prayed for. It just sometimes it's not like even what he's like given me, but what he's kept from me. Mm. That's a great observation. No pun intended. Very good. Anyone else? Well, as you can see, the, the photograph that I have posted is one of the handful of true self-portraits I have taken. And uh, of course, it's me um, holding up my camera. And as a photographer, um, I tell people I pray through my viewfinder all the time. And uh, making my way through the world, you know, like Sandy said, uh, making my way through nature and capturing the beauty of nature and then coming home and uploading the photographs, editing them. And uh, that whole process has really become a, a spiritual act for me. It's a, it is a um, form of prayer for me. And um, I, I and so that's really one of the, the main ways I pray. Um, um, I will say um, I'm not one, but my um, experience has um, um, led me to learn that deer hunters are really great at this. Um, and I have known deer hunters in my life who have said, I have prayed my best prayers in a tree stand. And uh, because you're in the quiet of nature and you cannot move, you cannot make a sound and you hear everything happening around you. You're observant and paying attention to everything around you. And um, in many ways that quiets and settles their minds and hearts. And it becomes a very spiritual um, experience for them. Um, and so Um, again, I'm not a deer hunter, but I do know that um, that is what I've been told. I know a lot of people who also walk um, and uh, they pray as they walk and as they observe and pay attention to what's happening around them. Um, recently, I read a book entitled On Looking, A Walker's Guide to the Art of Observation by Alexandra Horowitz. Um, it's an interesting book, but she, write, she writes in the preface, quote, we see, but we do not see. We use our eyes, but our gaze is glancing frivolously considering its object. We see the signs, but not their meanings. We are not blinded, but we have blinders. Though paying attention seems simple, there are numerous forms of payment. I reckon that every child has been admonished by a teacher or parent to pay attention, but no one tells you how to pay attention. I thought that was very interesting that we tell children to pay attention all the time, but rarely do we tell them how to pay attention. So I wonder how, if, Uh, any of us have been truly taught how to pay attention. Uh, okay, Pastor. Go ahead. Yes. I, I was having trouble uh, unmuting, but 
my uh my spiritual paying attention is always I I I have all I have prayed to uh for God to give me the ability to know when he is guiding me to do something or to not do something and to listen to that. And so when I come across like, am I going to go to church or am I going to do this thing? If I'm, if, if my mind has said, now nah, I don't think I'm going to go this time. or I don't think I'm going to do. And then there's this nagging thing that doesn't let me put it to rest and say, okay, no, I'm not going to do it or I'm going to do it. And that's it. And so I think that that is my paying attention to what I have prayed and asked God to give me the ability to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, a very important spiritual practice to pay attention to our own experiences and what we're feeling. Um, because oftentimes in seeking direction and discernment, the answer is already within us. And um, in cooperating with the Holy Spirit, that answer rises to the forefront. And sometimes in our resistance, we have to let that have to let that resistance go and follow in that direction. If at least that's what I'm hearing, please correct me if I'm wrong. That's one of my prayers too. I was like, pray for the sun. I'm like, and I would say, Lord, I'm not, I'm not this smart. You got to pretty much slap me inside my head for me to, to know that you're speaking to me, like speak to me to a way that I can really understand. Cause my mind goes a million different things. Like as soon as I think of something, my mind would think of 30 different contradictions. And then just, so I'm like, I never know what is the Holy Spirit speaking to me or it's just my mind. It just goes a million different ways. So that's how like, you, like I pray about the sermon and, and just for him to just make it clear a way that I would know without a doubt, like yeah. to un pray that all like literally every day. Yeah. So actually I have another word for that. I, um, I often pray for distillation. And so, because my mind is the same way, it goes in so many different directions and I I'm like, okay, which, where, where is the truth that I need to come away with? And so my prayer is that the that all that is going on, all that I have, all of those ingredients will be distilled, um, go through the distillation process, and uh, and will uh, will come out on the other side. Yeah. Anyone else before we move on? So as you might expect, uh, tonight's Bible study is a little bit more reflective in nature, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But we turn the page to uh, the observations Kohelet has in chapter four. Um, it's structured around five observations, um, all pertaining to things uh, in life under the sun. And in the NRSV, uh, they all begin with the phrase, I saw. Um, some translations will say, I have observed, or I noticed that. Um, but there's always that signal, and then what follows. So the five observations are um, oppression, envy, loneliness, relationships, and politics. And... Uh, don't let this word terrify you yet. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. So we're not going to get political in this Bible study, but we will talk about the nature of politics in life under the sun and what Kohelet observes. So let's get started with um, the observing oppression Liberation as subtraction. If you turn to, if you have your Bibles in front of you, uh, please uh, turn them to chapter four, and we'll start with verse one. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power with no one to comfort them. 
And I commended the dead who have already died more than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. So remember, Kohelet is a Jew. He is a faithful son of Judea who knows well his history, his background, and his story. We can almost imagine him reflecting upon the oppression he sees happening in the world as he prepares for the celebration of Passover, the story of Israel's exodus from Egypt. It is a story of oppression and liberation from bondage. And the story of Israel is a story of oppression and liberation, beginning with the exodus from Egypt to the Babylonian exile, and then later to the Persian, Greek, and Roman occupations. Kohelet and his people know oppression. They have not known what it has been like to live in a free homeland for hundreds of years now. And much of Jewish worship life and their holy days, their calendar, centers around these themes of liberation from oppression. And many of these holy days are still continued and practiced in Judaism today. However, Kohelet's oppressions of, or Kohelet's observations of oppression go so much deeper than geopolitical conquests and foreign occupation. They tend to um, cut much deeper into um, the everyday lived experiences of the human being. And we've already seen him allude to these oppressions. We probe the ways of wisdom only to be met with huh, that gruff sigh of exasperated exhaustion. We observe that there is justice in the world, but next to it is wickedness. There is evil standing alongside righteousness. And what's more, there is no, there are no apparent sympathies to assuage these oppressive forces. There's nothing to end them. They seem to be like those cycles we talked about last week, that there's no end in sight. And so the question is, where is God in all of this? Where is God? Does God heed our outcry because of our taskmasters, as Exodus says? Or is God the taskmaster we should heed the most? Is God mindful of our suffering? Or is God the mastermind behind our suffering? Does God come to our rescue? Or does God come to our ruin? Most of all, is there any relief from it? You know, I find these questions very timely. Um, I'm, I'm very mindful uh, this evening of uh, folks that are near and dear to our own congregation and other friends and family members that we may know who are in the path of Hurricane Milton, um, a terrifyingly strong uh, Category 5 hurricane um, that is expected to make landfall tonight. And, um, you know, it's not even made landfall yet. And already I have heard and seen uh, things online and, you know, overhearing things that these hurricanes are God's judgment on us. God is trying to tell us something. God is, what is God trying to tell us? What is as if God is allowing or is sending these hurricanes to wreak uh, havoc and create massive destruction. Is that the kind of God we worship? Or maybe 
these increasingly strong storms are nature's way to tell us that we've abused nature for way too long. And the climate crisis is getting out of my hand. And I'm going to stop right there before I get on that soapbox. But um, whenever things happen that cause suffering, um, we often ask, where is God in all of this? But as we discussed last week, God is first and foremost a God of relationship, um, a God of loving relationships. And um, is there any relief from the oppression that we experience in our lives? Well, in fact, that there is. Um, you know, because we worship a God of relationship, investing in relationships will cause these oppressions to lose their defining power in our lives. You know, uh, it's not exactly a direct correlation, but you know what? Yes, hurricanes make landfall and lives um, are, our livelihoods are completely destroyed. But what I have loved seeing um, and what never ceases to amaze me um, is the amount of relief and support that comes to those uh, devastated communities. And it shows that um, relationships thrive and work wonders in the midst of suffering and oppression. And it also, um, relief also comes when we recognize that the path to liberation is not through addition necessarily, but through subtraction. Uh, Father Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest, once said, Christianity is not so much a spirituality of addition, where you add this skill and that achievement, as it is a spirituality of subtraction especially in the affluent West, peeling away the things that don't matter or keep us in bondage is the solution to much that ails the human soul. Christianity is not so much a spirituality of addition as it is a spirituality of subtraction. And so I'll ask you, what oppressions can we be liberated from by practicing the spirituality of subtraction? Your turn. So, um, <clears throat> Coelho spoke about it um, in chapter four, where he was saying how people who toil so much, they never have enough, and you lose that just being close. And it's like one of my coworkers just asking me, it was literally yesterday where she was saying she, she's got into fitness working out. And she was like, Oh, should I go to my niece's last game? Or should I like do my CrossFit? I'm like, CrossFit is always going to be there. These are like these memories, which are like niece and things like that. But we strive so much for achievement, achievement to do something better, better, better. But if you kind of subtract that, that pressure on you to try to be perfect, and you will lose that and you but I still say you add because you add that more fulfilling life with others in relationship because those memories are something that's going to last way longer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the uh, We could uh, be freed up from the oppression of uh, greed and envy. Mm -hmm. You're always uh, feeling that and uh, always feeling the need to compete with someone or become better or the best of something mm -hmm. or the best at something, should I say. So we could be freed up from, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. Picking on what Vernice said, <laughs> subtra like the subtracting, like she said, that comparison. Like I tell my friends all the time, I think social media is like, I, like just social media in general, it's good. It's great. Like we have Bible study. You can reach everyone. But I said, it just, to me, sometimes it's just one of the worst things we ever invented because I feel like our mind was not made to take in this much information. We have limited space. Like, and you always going to see someone doing better than you. You always going to see one. And then it's nothing but a highlight reel. 
So you're going to always do that comparison and feeling like you don't have enough. You're not doing enough. You're not enough. And that's what's like killing like a lot of our like kids, teenagers, because they do that comparison shopping like all the time. But it's always going to be someone better. It's always going to be someone worse than you. Always going to be someone better than you. But they don't think of it like that. They just think of the ones that's better than them. Yeah, and it's and especially with our teenagers, that pressure is constantly upon them, not just through social media, but um, the pressure to achieve and be the best um, is upon is always laid upon them. So you can get into a good college, so you can get scholarships, those sorts of things, and it's um, it's really doing a lot of harm to our children and teenagers. Um, but, you know, it's I actually see signs of this uh, being rejected by young adults, teenagers today. Um, so I held up my camera um, a little bit ago and one of the most frequently purchased items in adults ages 18 to 25 right now are film cameras. They have rejected digital photography and, go, and have gone to film photography. Um, I was talking to someone at Robert's camera just the other day, and they said it's amazing how many of them also come in and buy darkroom equipment and set up their own dark rooms in their homes. Um, so um, I also recently learned that um, one of the other hot uh, commodities that young adults are buying up are typewriters and are using typewriters more than computers these days, which is mind boggling to me. And then um, this, is a, this is one you probably are already familiar with, um, is the resurgence of popularity in vinyl records. Um, and, you know, People buy record players and turntables and vinyl. Um, and in fact, a lot of artists are producing uh, not CDs, and but, uh, but in addition to the streaming, they'll produce vinyl uh, that can be purchased at places like Barnes and Noble. And then I know there's plenty of, there are several vinyl shops here in Indy. So it's really incredible to see how the pressures of social media and technology um, that have really become oppressive are being rejected in favor of what uh, some people call dumb technology. It's pretty amazing. Um, if I can share vulnerably and personally with all of you, one of the oppressions that I have constantly needed to seek liberation from is both consumerism and materialism. Um, I fully admit, I like nice stuff. Um, and I don't apologize for that because there's nothing inherently wrong with liking the finer things of life. But I have succumbed in the past to striving to get those things and to attain those uh, finer things for myself. And, um, you know, growing up, one of the things I was told more than you might w believe is that the pinnacle of success, if you are successful, then you will wear a Rolex watch on your wrist. And I remember shortly after I got my first full-time ministry job, I went to um, my hometown jewelry store and I purchased, a, albeit a pre-owned Rolex watch. And in that moment, I felt, I looked down at my wrist and I felt like I was on top of the world. But after a while, that that watch sat more in its box than it did on my wrist. And in my own spiritual life, I looked at it one day and I said, since when does that define my success? And so I sold it. I got rid of it. And... Um, 
when I sent it on to its next owner, there was something I felt in my soul that's, that was very freeing to me. And um, so I, I still think that for many, consumerism and materialism is an oppression that we constantly need to be liberated from uh, by practicing the spirituality of subtraction. Well, because it's our society bombards us with this like Mm -hmm. all day, every day, where it's just more and more. You need the newer thing, the newest phone, Mm -hmm. just the newest TV. Everything's bigger, better, sleeker, more high tech. So it's that's I think everyone probably deals with that to a certain extent as far as consumerism. Just and I mean. I say that like with companies, like I always tell like people, I'm like, I hate like just corporations. I'm like, you made $2 billion. You don't need to cut your quality to make $4 billion. Lay people off so you can have, so you can like not pay them. So now you bring in more money in, but you're not paying that much. Like it doesn't take all that. I'm like, when is enough is enough? Like you can't spend it all. Yeah. Yeah. The, there is a, a huge ethical Uh, discussion over whether or not billionaires should even exist because uh, many argue that hoarding that much wealth is inhumane and I think there's a there's an argument that could be made for that but again I said we weren't going to get political (laughs) (laughs) Um, but um, another thing that I want to Um, I think in that vein, you said, you know, that kind of this pressure to always have the newest and the best and the shiniest and the glitziest, kind of that pressure to keep up with the Joneses, if you will, is a great segue into our next observation, and that's envy. Um, If you wanted to, if you would like to follow along, um, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 4. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from one's one person's envy of another. This also is vanity and a chasing after wind. Fools fold their hands and consume their own flesh. Better is a handful with quiet than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. So envy is not a common word we use either in the church or in our culture much these days, despite phrases like being green with envy. Or if we do use a word like envy, we use it carefully and sparingly. It carries more weight than words like jealousy or covetousness. So what's the difference? I think think this might be helpful for us to consider. What is the difference between jealousy, covetousness, and envy? First, jealousy stems from fear. The fear of losing something that is um, important, valuable, or precious to you. Um, It also stems from the fear of someone else taking what you have. Jealousy says, this is mine, and you can't have it. And in some respects, jealousy is, albeit harmless, and can even be beneficial. You know, elsewhere in the Bible, you may recall that uh, God is defined as a jealous God. And, you know, what does that mean, that God is a jealous God? Well, it denotes that Um, God is divinely impassioned with zeal for the people of Israel. They are God's people. They are God's precious possession, if you will. And um, God is only defined as being jealous when Israel is unfaithful to God and goes off to worship the deities of their ancient Near Eastern neighbors. And so you can think of God's jealousy um, as being fueled by that infidelity. It would be as repugnant 
as infidelity in the context of a monogamous relationship. Uh, that you have left me for someone else. You are my chosen precious possession and you have been unfaithful to me. That's where God's jealousy stems from. And so um, because God shares in relationship with us, I don't think it's really a stretch to say that God was fearful that Israel would be unfaithful to God. And so I think that context is very powerful and gives us a new dimension of who God is. Second, covetousness is best known for being prohibited in the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or their male or female slave or his ox or his ass or anything that is your neighbor's. We know that uh, final Tenth Commandment. Now, in Hebrew, the word to covet means to scheme or to acquire. So covetousness is desiring something that belongs to someone else and scheming or conspiring to take it away from them and take it for yourself. That's what covetousness is. And then there's envy. Envy is not only considered sinful in the Bible, but it is also listed as one of the seven deadly sins. So what makes envy so deadly? Well, it can lead to the destruction of what another person has. The theologian Neil Planninga writes, to covet is to want somebody else's good so strongly that one is tempted to steal it. To envy is to resent somebody else's good so much that one is tempted to destroy it. Um, it I know there's a typo there. It should be envy. So let me pick, uh, let me change that real quick. Envy carries overtones of personal resentment. An envier resents not only somebody else's blessing, but also the one who has been blessed. And if I can add on to Planninga's observation, to envy also shows resentment towards the God who blesses. Simply put, envy is deadly because it destroys relationships and it can destroy us from the inside out if it is left unchecked. One of my favorite professors in seminary was the late social ethicist, Dr. Christine Pohl. And in her book, Living Into Community, she, she writes, in scripture, Envy is often listed with other sins that destroy fellowship. Because it most always involves comparisons, envy flourishes in close-knit communities. In fact, envy strikes most powerfully in those intimate relations where love is supposed to rule. We end up being hypocritical. What we say does not match what we are feeling. In this way, envy falsehood, and deception are closely connected. When we struggle with envy, we often withdraw from relationships or become indifferent to those around us. So what do we do about envy? Well, we find that Kohelet really copes in the middle, and he offers us two extremes. The first extreme is the way of the fool, the one who folds their hands together and does no work at all and thus self-destructs. And he uses that image of uh, eating their own flesh, self-destruction. And I think he could have chosen a less grotesque image, but still the point is made. On the other end is workaholism, endless labor which also proves to be futile in the end. 
and can be very, very destructive. Um, I, without going into details, do know people whose marriages have fallen apart because one or both of them are workaholics. And they invested so much into their labor, their toil, their work, that their relationships uh, completely just disintegrated. So our work should ne neither stem from envy, nor should it lead us to envy. It should always lead us to a place of contentment causing us to say both I have enough and I am enough. I have enough, I am enough. And so for discussion, I wonder how do you see envy manifested and how do we stop envy in its path? Oh, um, Pastor Keith, it was something that I started to think about, um, like when you were just explaining the difference between like covetousness and the and just jealousy um, there. And I was thinking about this. Um, there was a time when I was in college and one of my friends came from the military to come and visit for a while and she parked her car. And uh, we were going to see Joseph for like a second. And then when we came back someone had broken into her car and they were trying to steal her like stereo system out of the car. And because they couldn't steal it, they just completely destroyed it. Mm. And I never understood like that, that level of like envy of like, mm -hmm. it, you know, I don't want you to have it. Like I can't have it for myself. I can't have this thing for myself. I can't take it. So I don't want you to have it either. And right. so that was really, I just, I could never wrap my head around it, but now like I have like the words for it. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, that's a great example of the destruction envy can cause. Anybody else? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, one thing we can do is just learn to appreciate the talents, the gifts, the all the things that God has through God that we have and just learn to be satisfied with that and not feel like if I don't have this or if I don't do that, then I'm I have less of a status or you know or insignificant to others. We have to have that high, high self-esteem where we, we're we just so satisfied with who we are and what we have and what we can do that we don't have to constantly seek after and try to upstage this and upstage that. And, uh, and see, when we were talking about oppression, I was thinking coming uh, out of poverty, the oppression that I'm starting to just release myself from is not feeling like I have money. I don't have a lot of money, but I do have a little money and I have enough to take care of myself and to share and do some other things. And so I'm training myself now. It is okay to part with it, buy something, do something for your house for yourself or for others. Well, well, I do more for others with my money than I do for myself. So for myself and not feel like you've done something wrong because you have spent some of your money on you. Mm -hmm. So that just feeling good about, and I'm around people who have lots of things that I don't have and, you know, and, Decorate, decorate and redecorate all the time. And when I look around my home, I'm like, you know what? That's their home and that works for them. Mm -hmm. And I do have you no know, people who I got to get this. This is out now. This is I have the same living room furniture that I had when I moved into this house 21 or 22 years ago. 
And I don't plan on getting rid of it in my lifetime because it serves the purpose. It fills the room, you know, and I can sit on it and others can. So just be feeling good about yourself and your position. And then if you don't, get up and do something about it that's positive. Don't sit around and sulk or figure out how you can destroy somebody else's happiness. Get up, do something about it, improve yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think if we turn those feelings into positive energy for ourselves, the world would be a lot of, of uh, a much better place. Most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? So I actually have a really uh, interesting example about envy. And before we move on, um, some of the most envious people I have ever met are pastors who are envious. And this goes much further than just jealousy or even covetousness. This is envy of another pastor's ministry. And I have seen pastors who are so envious of another pastor that they try to destroy their ministry um, and the churches they serve. And in fact, I don't know if you knew this or not, but in our book of discipline of the United Methodist Church, one of the chargeable offenses against a pastor is undermining the ministry of another appointed pastor. And um, in fact, it has happened so frequently that the United Methodist Church has made it a chargeable offense. Um, and when you resent another pastor who may be in a better appointment than you know, you say, well, you know, I'm more gifted or I'm more talented or I'm more skilled than they are. And they got the tall steeple church and I'm out here in potato run. And, you know, those feelings of envy can really get out of hand. And uh, it has it has happened. Uh, pastors are not exempt from envy and really. Uh, and so making it a chargeable offense in the book of discipline is one way we can stop envy in its path uh, to keep our pastors and our churches protected. So uh, that's just my example. Moving on to the next observation, we're moving through these. Uh, we don't have too many more, so we're, we're making good progress here. Loneliness. So let's go back to the scriptures. And now we are in verse seven. Again, I saw vanity under the sun, the case of solitary individuals without sons or brothers, yet there is no end to all their toil and their eyes are never satisfied with riches. For whom am I toiling, they ask, and depriving myself of pleasure. This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Well, as you might expect, traditional interpretation has believed this observation to be an advocacy for marriage and a chastisement against singleness. Um, I will say that I completely reject that interpretation, um, and I believe we all should. Um, this interpretation has taken root primarily because of the verses that follow and their commonality in wedding ceremonies, and we'll talk about that. Um, nonetheless, uh, this interpretation is to miss the point of Kohelet's observation entirely. What's more um, is that this uh, interpretation um, it really has no uh, stop to it, um, advocating that the only valid way to be human and to live as a human being is in the context of a homogenous, um, heterosexual, monolithic family uh, that has procreated. 
Um, and we know that in this day and age that families come in all shapes and sizes and are made up of biological members as well as logical chosen members. And so um, I think that this traditional interpretation needs to die, frankly. Um, and rather we see what is being observed and challenged here are the willful choices that we can make that lead to loneliness or uh, the choices that we make that set our priorities askew and cause relationships to suffer. Um, one thing about workaholism, you know, we mentioned it earlier, is that it is extremely isolating. It basically causes an individual to withdraw from the relationships that they have. And so it begs the question, um, what does it mean to live in community? Last year, um, I found it um, very telling that our current Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, declared loneliness to be an epidemic in the United States. And in his published advisory, he notes that loneliness is a greater risk for cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. It Loneliness, um, living in loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes per day. It is a greater health risk than obesity or physical inactivity. And it disproportionately affects children and adolescents aged 5 to 15, as well as older adults. What's more, in 2018, the last time this study was done, only 16% of Americans reported that they felt very attached to their local community. And in this study, the reason for this is that there is a growing cultural askance toward institutions and organizations. And because people are skeptical and cynical of institutions and organizations, um, there is a greater skepticism and cynicism toward community in and of itself. Um, I would be very interested to know what this statistic is um, on the other side of the COVID pandemic. And, you know, this, um, you know, we often um, lick our wounds and talk about how so many people are skeptical and cynical against institutional uh, religion and organized religion. Uh, churches, um, you know, make the top of that list. But you know what? This affects everybody from the Methodists to the Masons. Um, any sort of institution and organization people are reluctant to become involved with. Um, and I'm sure there are plenty of reasons for that. Um, in the end of his advisory, uh, the Surgeon General writes, Loneliness and isolation represent profound threats to our health and well-being, but we have the power to respond. By taking small steps every day, we can rise to meet this moment together. We can build lives and communities that are healthier and happier, and we can ensure our community and world are better poised than ever to take on the challenges that lay ahead. So, how have you seen loneliness manifested and how do we combat it? We've seen that a lot with, um, since Lee has been in the hospital and rehab, just how devastating that was for her um, mentally and physically and spiritually um, to be isolated from her friends and not keeping active. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, certainly any sort of medical complication that uproots us from day-to-day -day life and friendships and relationships does tend to plunge us into loneliness. Yeah. And Any I think a lot of depression will do that too. And the more you get depressed, the more you just want to sleep or 
stay inside or, you know, take refuge and not be around other people. And it's like this self-fulfilling prophecy, this cycle that just keeps, you know, getting worse and harder to get out of. Yeah. It kind of goes like in a circle, like you said, where that loneliness, you might go to different vices, like drugs. Some people, like they say, it's greater than like obesity, you know, cardiovascular things. But some people eat away their loneliness. Like it make you to try to find that fulfillment in other places, even though it's just like a it's a quick gratification. And like it's brief, like eating something really good or like using drugs. But that loneliness still be there. but you're still trying to escape it. So you're really just, like I said, it's a cycle. And then you're going to feel bad about it. Like, oh, I wasted my time doing all this. Then you're going to feel depressed about it. And the reason you did it because you're depressed, then you're going to just do it back again. Then you're going to feel bad about it again after you do it again. Yeah. I have an example of that too. Like during COVID, I think a lot of people kind of felt that like kind of disconnect from just everybody and everything, especially when we were kind of like on lockdown. And I noticed I bought so much stuff, just like unnecessary stuff <laughs> on Amazon and every website, like everywhere, just to like have things coming to the house, just because like, It was like nothing else going on. I already work from home, so I don't really have to go out. And then I didn't really go anywhere else. So it was just like, okay, I'm going to kind of try to make myself happy by buying things. And I had so many packages coming to the house. And I think that's one of the things that some people do too. Like if they don't, if they don't like do drugs or, you know, do anything to kind of like mask like their depression, they can also like start turning to like things like shopping and things like that. That kind of was what happened with me during COVID. Yeah, there's there is such a thing as uh, there is such a thing as um, retail therapy, mm -hmm. but there is also such a thing as being a shopaholic. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I um, um, for a while I saw a therapist, um, and I don't now um, because. Um, at her words, I've graduated. Uh, <laughs> but um, I remember um, as we were coming to on the other side of COVID, she said to me, you know, the research has shown that um, drinking problems skyrocketed during the pandemic. And um, so, you know, now um, treatment centers and um, organizations like AA, And, um, you know, therapists and psychologists have, um, you know, the studies have shown that just the numbers skyrocketed during the pandemic. Um, you know, so it kind of goes back to your point, you know, a lot of people uh, cope with alcohol and abuse it. And, um, you know, so that's, um, that can certainly be uh, tied to loneliness. Um, I have been very encouraged to see the different ways that people find community. And, you know, some of us, you know, will we'll say, you know, we have found community in the church. And certainly the church is a wonderful source of community that we uh, lean into and develop relationships and friendships Um, some people turn to clubs and fraternal organizations to find community and are very successful in that. But other people turn to gyms and yoga studios. And um, I remember in one of my darkest seasons of life, um, I did not find supportive community. When I felt most alone, I did not find supportive community in the church. I actually found it in my gym. Uh, the people I worked out with came around me and supported me and made me realize that I'm not alone. And, um, you know, that 7.15 a.m. workout class was my reason to get up. Because if I didn't, they would be worried and they would be wondering where I was. And so uh, that was my touch point with community every day. 
So there are a lot of ways that we can find and discover community and uh, combat loneliness. So um, the next observation is relationships themselves. And um, I know Sandy Potenza, since we have two Sandys on the call tonight, um, mentioned that she has heard um, Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, read at funerals. But I wonder how many of you have heard verses 9 through 12 at a wedding ceremony. Verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. I wish all of you were on camera because I would ask for a raise of hands. How many of you have ever heard that? Uh, heard those verses read in a wedding ceremony? And in fact, um, um, so real quick, this observation is the only positive in a series of four negatives. So all, the other four observations are negative. This is a positive one. Um, and um, in wedding ceremonies, these verses are often associated with a ritual called the unity braid, where the couple will weave and braid uh, three ropes together to symbolize uh, the, the couple and God coming together as one. And in fact, you can go on Etsy and order unity braids to buy for your wedding ceremony. Um, now, it's a, it's a lovely ritual. It's a lovely um, idea. Uh, but the scholar in me recoils every time I see it at a wedding because I'm like, once again, they have missed the point of what Kohelet is trying to say. Nowhere is Kohelet implying a marital union here. Um, he is implying the necessity of companionship and relationship. Um, yes, companionship can be found in marriage, but it can also be found elsewhere. Um, I would also say that marriage also does not guarantee companionship. Um, I would also, um, I also want to let you know that these, um, this image, the idea of the threefold cord is not unique to Kohelet. Um, scholars universally agree that he borrowed it from the ancient Sumerian text, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, that is the earliest um, account of the image of the threefold cord is not easily broken, that we have an ancient Near Eastern literature. And so Kohelet likely borrowed it from the Sumerians and incorporated it in his own work. So I wonder what that threefold chord might look like in 2024. Um, how do we live out this ancient image that goes beyond unity braids at Christian wedding ceremonies? And no offense if you had one at yours. But first and foremost, um, there is the relationship we have with ourselves. The first uh, ply or the first uh, ply in that cord is um, the relationship we have with our inner selves. And isn't it amazing at how quickly we allow that rope to unravel and fray? Uh, we live in a day and age where so many of us feel disconnected from ourselves and we ignore self-care and leave ourselves neglected. And um, so I believe that should be strand number one. Uh, strand number two is, of course, the relationship that we have with others. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the Zulu word Ubuntu from South Africa, but it 
um, is translated as I am because you are. I am because you are. And if you are not, then I am not. And if you are not, then why not? We are designed to be communal, relational creatures. It's in our DNA. And to neglect our relationships with others is to neglect one of the most foundational aspects of being human. Um, you know, I understand that there are the introverts among us who relish being alone and thrive in that and prefer it. But And alone time is a good thing. But there's also too much of a good thing. And we cannot thrive alone, nor can we thrive in imbalance. Investing in Ubuntu, I am because you are, requires our intention and our energy. And it remains a requirement just the same. And then strand three is the relationship that we have with God. And um, however that strand looks in our lives, we all have that um, connection to God. Um, you know, people of different faiths, um, have, you know, um, weave that strand differently than we might. Um, for crying out loud, people of different Christian traditions might weave that strand differently than we do. But nonetheless, it is there. And so uh, for our discussion, how do we form and sustain relationships? How do we um, retie that threefold cord in our lives? Any thoughts? Well, by staying in communication with each other, like just kind of taking the time to just check in on people, how they're doing, just like they're every day, not just come together during funerals or bad times, but actually just like every day, just every now and then, because you're so easy to think about someone, do you get distracted by something? And then you forget about them, like, oh, I was just going to call that person. But I think that just checking in goes a long way. Like, hey, I just think about just checking on you. That does go a long way with people. Yeah. And um and by just by being faithful, being faithful in our relationship with uh, in our personal relationship with others and our spiritual relationship with God, just being faithful and being committed to it and and trying to hold ourselves accountable uh, for our behaviors with those relationships within those relationships. Mm -hmm. I think another big piece of that is allowing ourselves to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and, and put it, putting our true selves out and trusting the other person with that true being. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it is. It's uh, requires a lot of vulnerability to know another person deeply and to allow ourselves to be deeply known. And I have a friend who's single and I tell him that all the time because he has such a like cynical look. I'm like, you take any time, you're going to take a chance. Like you, you might get hurt. Like you can't just always have your guard up all the time where you don't allow yourself to like be vulnerable. I said, that's just, that's life. Like it's going to be good and bad. You got a 50% chance of everything. <laughs> like it's going to work out. It might not work out, but I tell him that all the time where he has to just be willing to take that hurt and don't let it, if it does not work out, to don't just let it reshape your way of thinking that you just give up completely. Like even with friendships, you're going to have bumps in the road. Like you're going to have disagreements. That don't mean you just throw away the whole friendship because of disagreements. Yeah. I often say, tell people I have been the dumpy and I've been the dumper. And uh, you know what? It, what neither one is easy, but you move on. And I will say that in every relationship that I've had, you know, thinking specifically of dating relationship, um, you know, I I learned something about myself that I carry with me.
and that has somehow made me a better person because of it. And and that what you said, being the better person, uh, that's that's so true, and that's what we strive for. Not only just like it said with the two, one can hold up the other, but not only you becoming a better person, if uh, and hopefully even if it didn't work out, it gave that other person some insight to oh, well, I need to do something and, you know, and, and maybe next time I need to make some changes or I need to be more understanding or be, uh, you know, more patient. But if everything does work out, you become a better person and then hopefully the other person becomes a better person as, you know, a partner in the relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we often say that relationships are two-way streets, and uh, when it becomes a one-way street with a sidewalk, that's when we get into trouble. And exactly. I think one of most, oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Exactly. When we, right, being too, too demanding in the relationship, not wanting to, always wanting your own way, never wanting to say, okay, I don't want to do this, but because of the relationship and what it may mean to the other person, then that is going to, you know, then I just need to do that and think about the relationship and not necessarily just about myself. Yeah. So one thing I was going to say is that I think goes a long way, admitting when you're wrong, the mental gymnastics people would do to not have to admit that they're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I've often said that eating crow is an acquired taste. The more <laughs> you eat it, the more it, it doesn't taste so bad after a while. Yeah. And, you know, this is not just true in relationships with significant others. This is true in every relationship that we have. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's not an easy thing to admit you're wrong, but uh, it's one of the most important things that we can do. Anybody else? All right. Well, the final observation, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's not the best for last, but um, it's politics or what I call politics. So looking at verse 13, better is a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who will no longer take advice. One can indeed come out of prison to reign, even though born poor in the kingdom. I saw all the living who, moving about under the sun, follow that youth who replaced the king. There was no end to all those people whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this is also vanity and chasing after wind. Um, so I uh, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this final observation is the most confusing one to scholars. It is complex and it is opaque, perhaps deliberately. Um, is Kohelet referencing a specific event or person, or is he maintaining the generalities of wisdom writing, just being general, broad strokes? Simply put, we do not know exactly what Kohelet is trying to say here. As far as we can tell, though, this is Kohelet's first indictment against the idea of kingship. And going back to the first observation of, is of oppression, Israel and Judea's history with kings is a troubled history. Um, you know, we begin, you know, as we look throughout the history of Israel, after um, the people of Israel crossed over into the promised land, they did not have a king. Uh, they really settled themselves as a federation of, of uh, tribes. 
and um, they had appointed judges to rule over them in matters of law and uh, structure. But then after a while, um, perhaps you can remember when uh, the prophet Samuel um, received the demands of the Israelites for a king, but not just a king, a king like all the other nations to rule over them. Now, the prophet Samuel was none too happy about that and tried to dissuade the Israelites from having a king. But finally, God said to the prophet, give them what they want and I'll take care of the rest. And since then, Israel's relationship to their king or their monarch, because they did have queens too, just has not, has been a cycle of uh, good, bad, and ugly all over again. And I believe um, through reading this observation, Kohelet's cynicism deepens in knowing that it is an institution that can do great good. In fact, in Israel, it was designed to do great good. Yet little good has risen from it. Um, and even with kings who are well-received and do their job well, after time, to use modern language, the approval rating will eventually plummet. Just give it time. Um, but I believe Kohelet is observing um, a much greater question. And it's the question is, where do we place our trust? And in his day and age, um, the people of ancient Judea put a great amount of trust in the king. And even though they were occupied by the Greeks, they still put a lot of trust in their, um, into their oppressors to give them what they needed for a successful life. And sometimes that trust was taken away from God and put onto the king himself or the queen herself. And um, I believe that's an important question for us today. Where do we place our trust, especially as we draw so close to a national election? Um, you know, I, I can hardly log on to social media without seeing Christians, people I know to be people of faith, um, who... Um, seem to place an, um, an unusually disturbing amount of trust into their political candidate of choice. Now, I have my political views. I have my, um, I, I have my candidates of choice. Um, but, you know, and I believe, and you know, obviously in casting a vote for them, I'm placing a certain amount of trust in them. But ultimately, as people of faith, um, our trust is in God alone. And um, we are citizens of another kingdom, the kingdom of God. We are citizens of the state, but we are also citizens of the kingdom of God. We hold dual citizenship. And we mustn't forget that. And so um, where do we place our trust? You know, whether it's the old foolish king or the young uh, whippersnapper who's just taken the throne. Um, it's all it all comes down to trust. And so the final question for tonight, and uh, this is what we'll um, we'll go out on. You know, how do we grow in our spiritual lives through our observations, as we observe life under the sun? And so this is really an open-ended question for you to ask questions or uh, share comments or insights that you may have in the, five, in the about five minutes we have left. I think it's just having to even not get too high, not get too low. You don't want to be lazy. You don't want to work to overwork yourself to death. Just kind of just keeping that equilibrium just mm -hmm. right down the middle. Mm-hmm.
or just trying to always balance it because sometimes you might one season you may tilt one way one season you may tilt the other but always trying to strive to find that middle ground yeah yeah And I would add in being intentional to, to try to find time each day, you know, to talk to God or to look at the majesty of God's creation or to read scripture or um, be on a Bible study, whatever it is, just to keep you listen to Christian music. I mean, I love doing that in the car. I think it's a, a form of praise and worship and um I think just trying to take those moments when you can and um, try to do that. So you stay in tune and in relationship with God. Yeah. One thing that works for me is uh, staying connected. Like Sandy said, staying connected to the church, uh, not the church itself, but the, the people at, at church, uh, trying to uh, do these type of things like participate in Bible studies and other things that will grow and increase my knowledge of God and the uh, scriptures so that I can use that to go forward and apply it in all the situations uh, in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there, I will say this. Um, I have heard it said that uh, there's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. You know, we can't, we can't be Christians alone. We have to be in relationship with others. We have to be in community with others. So true. And that, that works for me, you know, yeah, I, uh, just and 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 just 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 experiencing experiencing uh you know all of the things that are out there to be learned as far as how can i become a better christian to increase my faith so that the work that i do is meaningful to someone else because I'm in the position that I'm in now in my life because of the help that I got from a teacher when I was in sixth grade. And, you know, I'll share that story uh, one, one time. Sandy knows it and other people, you know, from Horizon, they know it. And so I want to be able to pass on fruitful things uh, to give back to the fruit that God provided me through the people who helped me get to where I am now. Yeah. That's great, Bernice. Thank you. Anything else? This off the subject, but is this always going to be the information so when I don't get it I, I can just pull out this same ID number and passcode or whatever it is that I really didn't need no I will be generating a new link every week um, oh, okay. yeah Bernice um, I will be going uh, and checking which email you have in our database and um, if it is not the email address that you have given me, then I will update that for you. Okay. Because I updated it with Ether a while ago, but, you know, things yeah. happen. So, okay. Of well, course. I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. I'll double check. Okay. Thanks. Well, in the time that we have left, um, I wanted to uh, do a quick moment of housekeeping. Um, the next two weeks, I will be on vacation. And so... Um, I will be pre-recording uh, Bible study videos that will be posted to the church's YouTube channel. So uh, just be on the lookout for those. And I will also have Etha email the links to those so you can view them in my uh, while I'm away. Um, I will say in preparation for next week, uh, please plan to read chapters five and six. And then on the following week, uh, chapters seven and eight. And then we will be back on Zoom 
um, October 30th as we um, study chapter nine together. So uh, it'll be YouTube recordings next two weeks, and then we'll be back together on Zoom on October 30th. And, um, and with that, I will close our time together with the way we opened. The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Go in peace. Have a wonderful rest of the night.